Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, Kremerspiegel, The Shopkeeper's Mirror. This is a set of uh, 12 songs that were written by Richard Strauss, uh, Richard Strauss, um, in 1918. Um, and they have a very interesting story. They're very interesting songs and they have an interesting backstory, uh, which I want to go into in a little bit of detail. So they were written in 1918, but the story starts 20 years earlier, really, uh, when um, Strauss uh, started a campaign to get fair royalties for composers. Now, I'll just give you a little bit of, of background on that. So, the German Empire uh, was founded in 1870. There's a unification of Germany, it's often called, uh, in 1870, uh, after the victory in the Franco-Prussian War. And the, and the German uh, government, Bismarck and so on, they wanted to make Germany into a modern state. And so they introduced copyright laws. So they gave copyright uh, an artist, a uh, composer or whoever, had uh, the, the rights to their music. Uh, the copyright lasted for 30 years after their death. Sounds great. The only problem was, how is this to be collected? Who collects it? Now, what uh, sort of happened was, that in fact, it was the publishers that ended up collecting the royalties uh, and performance fees, uh, effectively, and controlling. Uh, they got all the money after it. And uh, all that happened for composers, if they were lucky, they got a one-off publishing fee. Uh, so when, when the manuscript was published, the composer got some money. And after that, they got nothing. Um, and this didn't seem very fair to Strauss. What Strauss wanted was a situation whereby uh, the composer or the artist would get money, uh, royalties pretty much, uh, you know, uh, with each performance or in the future. They'd still have the rights to collecting those royalties or some access to those royalties. But that was his idea. And in fact, it was even worse really for composers, uh, even in late 19th century Germany. It, it was even worse before, of course. Uh, but. Um, you know, a lot of composers found it very difficult to make money out of composing, and that's why composers used to do have second jobs. So, like Strauss and Mahler, they were conductors. Uh, you might teach in a conservatoire, or you might do something completely unrelated to, to composition. So, life was quite hard for composers. And uh, what Strauss saw, and he, and he wrote a letter to, to, to the, it's a very interesting letter. Um, what he wrote was, well, look, you know, us composers, you know, we don't get much money, but you look at the publishers, and they're very rich. Now that sounds quite familiar. It's the same story today, you know, people talking about uh, music streaming, Amazon, iTunes, etc. Uh, the stars are always complaining, we don't get any money. Uh, all the money goes to Jeff Bezos, uh, whoever owns that I uh, iPhone. So, um, you know, that, that, that's, that, that's a, a long thing. And again, if we go back, it's, it was the same as the 60s and 70s with record companies. Artists have always been complaining about this. So this is actually uh, a very, very a common universal issue really, the fact that composers don't get paid enough. A lot of people make money out of their music, but they don't see very much of that music. There are exceptions, and in fact Strauss is one of the best paid composers of the time because he's, he was a leading composer in Germany uh, at that time, but still uh, it wasn't really very, very satisfactory uh, for, for him and certainly not for his, for his colleagues. So what did he do about this? Well. Uh, in 1898, he basically set up an association for composers. Uh, uh, the the um, Genossenschaft der Ton, uh, Deutsche Komponisten. And it, la later the word Komponisten was replaced by Tom Zeppelin, and they're both words for composer. So he set this up in, in, in 1898 with his friend Friedrich Rösch. Now, Friedrich Rösch had been to school with him, and they'd known each other for quite a long time, and he was a lawyer. So this is very important. So you had a top composer in Germany at that time, and you had a really, uh, you know, good lawyer, uh, and they set this thing up. And who were their enemy? Well, the enemies were the publishers, because what the publishers had done, they set up their own uh, group association, if you like, um, the Anstalt für Musikalisches Aufführungsrechts (AFNA), the Institute for Musical Performance Rights. Sounds very nice, Institute for, for Musical Performance Rights, but basically it was all set up by the uh, by the publishers, and obviously they benefited mostly from it. And it was actually directed uh, by one Oscar von Haase, uh, who, whom we meet in, in, in the Kremerspiegel uh, in the third song. And uh, Hugo Bock, uh, another one that was also quite important. In this. So there was a bit of a battle that went on between the, the, the publishers and the composers, and it was quite bitter at times. There were even threats of a strike, I won't go into details. But in the end, the composers won. Uh, and, you know, by 1903, there was a there was a copyright uh, in, in in 
1901 it was it was revised uh, and in 1903 um, the whole thing was settled and half of that went to the composer a quarter to the publisher and a quarter to the lyricist and if there was no lyricist then that went to the composer as well so that was a much much better uh, but better settlement. There was some unfinished business. Uh, the 30 year limit to copyright, that was seen as, um, that was seen as a bit too short. Uh, in fact, they wanted to have it perpetual, in fact, the, the, the composers. Um, but eventually, it rose to 50 years, and it's now 70 years. So uh, things went on, but uh, that, that was basically a victory that was won. And Strauss played an absolutely crucial role in this, in organizing and bringing together the composers in Germany uh, and Austria, and uh, it, it was very successful. Okay, so now we come to the specific, that, that's a general thing, so there's a general dislike of publishers which is fairly universal. Now, having said he disliked publishers in general, of course, like all musicians, he works with publishers a lot, and he had his own favourite publisher. And there are two uh, publishers which uh, stick out in particular, uh, Eugen Spitzweg, he was the guy from the Munich publisher, uh, Joss Abel, um, and that eventually, uh, he died in 1914, and in fact, he also before, about 10 years before that, or, or a bit longer, he sold out his, his firm to Universal, a Viennese uh, company. The other person he liked worked, but Spitzweg was very important in developing his early career, very important indeed. Move on a little bit of time, there's the person at Publishing House, uh, there was a father, Adolf Bursner, who died in 1908, and his son, Otto, who, who lived until 1950. Uh, and uh, these Bursner were the publisher with whom he dealt most of the time uh, in, in, in the 20th century. Uh, but the Bursners were Jewish, so obviously when the Nazis came into power, uh, they, they left. Uh, and eventually the, the, the publishing rights that were associated with the Bursner migrated to Boozy and Hawks, uh, which is why Boozy and Hawks effectively became one of the large the main uh, Strauss publishers uh, of, uh, after his death, after Strauss's death. Anyway, that, that's, that's a sort of story there. So what about, where, what, where did this debate, uh, this dispute with Bertha and Bock, um, you know, where, where did it come from? Well, they'd actually paid a lot uh, for the rights to uh, Strauss's Domestic Symphony, which was published in 1904. Now, they paid a lot for this. Um, now, it's not surprising, he just finished his uh, Ein Heldenleben, uh, being completed in 1899, Don Quixote had, had been finished uh, the year before that, and Alzo Sprach a couple of years before that, so he'd just written three really popular symphonic poems, and um, so they, there was great hope for, for the domestic symphony. In the end, it's one of his less successful uh, works. Um, but included in that contract was the agreement for Strauss to supply 12 songs. Now, of course, 12 songs for Strauss, he was writing songs all the time up until 1905. Um, and in fact, in uh, 1906, uh, Bert and Bock published the first six of these 12 songs, which are the Opus 56 songs, uh, which were published in 1906. These include some quite well known songs Gefunden, Frühlingsfeier. And uh, the Heiligen Drei Königer, As Morgenlath, those are all songs which have been recorded uh, many times and which are still quite well known. Uh, but after that, Strauss stopped writing songs uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, he was busy writing his operas, Electra, Ariadne Af Naxos, um, The Rosen Cavalier, Crown of Shatten, he was writing Alpine Symphony. So he had lots of other things on his thing, he just stopped writing songs. And to be fair, he'd been writing songs prolifically for, for the 25 years, well, uh, for two decades up to 1905, um, and so he had a bit of a rest. But by 1918, uh, he wanted to write some more songs. And of course, uh, Hugo Bock, who was running Bertram Bock, he, he, he was starting, he was saying, yeah, where, where are our songs? We paid for these uh, back, back in 1904. You know, we want our songs. And um, Strauss was very reluctant uh, to do that. I, I think partly it's just a dislike of, 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 of the box. Uh, uh, Hugo Bock, but also, which comes out, out very clearly in the, 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 uh, the songs, the Kramerspiegel songs, the first two, um, but also I think he, just, he was a bit broke. Uh, he'd invested a lot of his money in London, so in, in, in the period, a decade before the First World War, he became quite a, uh, uh, a regular visitor to Britain and he worked with Henry Wood and various other people, and his works were performed at the Proms and so on, so he made quite a bit of money. He's a bit of an Anglophile as well. 
and uh, one of the people, one of his best friends was uh, Hugo Speyer, who, who was a, a British banker, not well, British, he's actually from Mainz, and New York and so on, um, but a big, a big banking uh, family in, in, in Germany, um, and an uh, international banking family, and uh, he'd advised him to put his money in London. And so Strauss had put a lot of his money in London, and of course with the war, Strauss was a German, so all his money was taken away from him. So at the end of the First World War, he ended up with not very much money. And this was a bit of a, a blow to him because his aim had been, uh, after he found his chateau, to really uh, lift, stop conducting and just devote himself completely to composing. In fact, the, exactly the opposite happened. Uh, he, he, he went on to work in Vienna. Remember, he was 60 in 1924, so in 1918 he, he was 56. Um, and, you know, as, as anybody who knows Strauss, he's an extremely hard working musician. He's on tour all the time, going all over the place, conducting and so on. And, you know, he managed to, to mix conducting and composing quite well, given how hard he was working. But, uh, you know, he, he would have preferred to devote himself entirely to composition. But that dream, if you like, was taken away from him. And so he was looking to make a bit of money. So I think he wanted to sell his songs. So one of the songs he was work, set of songs he was working on was his Brentano leader. Uh, and um, he didn't want to give those to Bertha Bloch. He wanted to, he wanted to, to publish those separately. So uh, that's it. So... He realises he's going to have to um, supply some songs to Bertrand Bock. And in fact, you know, he, he met with uh, Alfred Roche to discuss how to go about this. So in the end, what he does is he gets together with Alfred Kerr. Now, Alfred Kerr was quite a famous um, Berlin uh, critic, music, uh, theatre critic, you know, pretty, somebody who's pretty well known. And uh, we don't, unfortunately, have the full backstory to this. Uh, obviously, they, they consulted about it because we can see in the actual text of the songs there's quite a lot of Strauss in there. Uh, so Alfred Kerr didn't make it out of nothing. They obviously talked to each other. But Alfred Kerr comes up with these nice little ditties, uh, which uh, which form the text, the text for the for the, for, for the shopkeeper's mirror. And um, the the text arrives on uh, Strauss's Berlin address at Strauss's Berlin address on March the 10th in 1918. So that's we know that's uh, that that's the case. What did Strauss do? He didn't start writing them straight away. Um, he waited a few days. In fact, he, he was in Amsterdam doing something, uh, conducting and so on, and he, he started writing them in Amsterdam. So uh, in, 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 in the period of a week, March 15th to 21st, he writes the songs 1, 3, 5, and 7, and also he writes sketches of 2 and 8. Um, and he completed them when he, was at, when he went back to Garmisch in, 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 in Bavaria. So in the week, the May 19th to 25th, he completes the songs 2 and 8, which, which, which he sketched. Uh, and then he wrote uh, songs 9, 10, 11, 12, and at the very end, 4 and 6. So that, that, that was the end of it. So he wrote, wrote his 12 songs. So there he had his 12 songs, and he posts them off to Burton Bock on May the 26th. And uh, then it's noted that the publisher returned them to, to Garmisch in Bavaria, uh, without comment, owner commentar, on June the 23rd. So both from Bock obviously looked at this, Hugo Bock looked at this, and, uh, uh, well, the songs aren't very complimentary to, to, to Paul Hugo Bock, so he sent them back. And he says, look, these songs won't do, we want some more songs. Now, of course, what happened was that Strauss went on to write some more songs, uh, which we can talk about later on, uh, which include the, the three songs of Ophelia, which are quite popular nowadays. Uh, to satisfy that Anyway, that's, that's the end of the story of Kramer speaking, if you like. The songs have been written. So what happens to them then? Well, uh, then it's a little bit of a, a, little bit of a uh, mystery. They sort of disappear for a little bit. Now, we do know that on August the 3rd, uh, in uh, 19, uh, 1918, he does actually, uh, he writes the Moonlight music uh, for Irene Hellman. So basically, the introduction to uh, the eighth song is written on the piano, and it's what became the moon. I shouldn't say moonshine, moonshine in German, but moonlight in English. Uh, it, it used to be moonshine, but that means something else nowadays. So uh, it was the moonlight music for Capriccio, which of course we know in the orchestrated version, but, the, but it actually was first written in uh, Kramerspiegel Song Eight, and uh, he wrote it. Uh, he wrote this as a separate thing for, as a gift, if you like, for Irene Hellman. To the Hellman, there were a couple who were great friends of Strauss's. So this sort of suggests maybe he was performing them, and uh, informally he might be performing these songs. But the songs uh, 
sort of disappear uh, and they, they, they resurface again three years later. In 1921, the, the art publisher from Vienna, uh, Paul Cassirier, publishes them. And it's actually published in Berlin, uh, but that's nothing. So Paul Cassirier is really a fine art publisher. And uh, these were done uh, with, um, with uh, engravings by the Czech painter Michael Fingerston. Uh, did, did, the, did, the, did the engravings. So uh, they're published there then uh, by Paul Cassieria, and but it's in a limited edition of 120. So it's done sort of in secret because, uh, in fact, uh, there's a bit of detail here. If you read Kurt Willen's biography of Strauss, he says that there's a legal injunction against these songs being performed or published. Now, uh, the details of this, again, are, are a little bit lost. Uh, and that's the only source that I've, I've come across. But, uh, but they're obviously being kept a little bit hidden. And also, if, if you read Norman Del Mar, he also claims that Alfred Kerr holds a private invitation-only performance at the Kaiserhof Hotel uh, in Berlin. Now, uh, this might not be correct, so we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit later. That's 1921. Um, then we, we can move on uh, a little bit later on. In 1925, in Berlin, there's the first, the premiere of the Kramerspiel. Now, this is called the premiere. This is from Trenner's book, von Trenner's book. Now, in a sense, I think von Trenner's book is probably a bit more reliable than Del Mar. Um, Del Mar uh, was, was writing in the 70s, uh, well, in the 60s, uh, and early 70s. Uh, and um, that's an advantage because there were probably some people still alive who knew Strauss quite well and, and might have had some memories of it. But of course, the memories might be wrong. Whereas Trenner, of course, Went through all of the. Uh, he did the. the, the he, he did the. Um, he went here all through Strauss's work, and there's this chronic. He, he does a day by day account of what Strauss is up to, and this is Trenner's version. He puts it ni November the 1st, 1925, in Berlin. The premiere of the Kramer Spiegel was sung by Sigrid Johansson. Now, notice that Sigrid Johansson, she was a soprano. And she's quite well known at the time. She, she, she was going next, the next month she was doing the, uh, the premiere of Al Albenberg's Wojtek, where she did the role of Mar uh, Marie. And so she was singing it, and it was accompanied by uh, a guy called Michael Rauch, Rauchheisen. So that's 1925. Now that premiere may be the same as the premiere that uh, Del Mar talks about, uh, but it happened in 1925 and not 1921. Uh, that's one possibility. Uh, the other possibility is just Norman Delmar got it wrong, uh, or Trenner got it wrong. I, I personally suspect it, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, Trenner got it right. And that happens then. The next year, 1926, Strauss has a musical soiree at Felix Deutsch's house. I think this again, is again in Berlin. Uh, so Felix Deutsch, the rich family. So it's not a public concert, but it's, it's, it's a soiree. Um, Strauss accompanies the Kramerspiegel. So he actually played it, and it's sung by the same soprano, Sigrid Johansson. So it's played by, by him then. It then sort of disappears, more or less, from Strauss's point of view. Uh, oh, and there's another performance, which Strauss doesn't, um, doesn't perform in, but he attends. So uh, this was in Mannheim in 1931. In October the 7th, after he conducted a lecture, uh, he attended the... Uh, the festival of the Bibliophile Society. So these are people who are interested in publishing, obviously. Um, it was actually performed by two people, Ernst Kremer and Joseph Rosenstock. So Ernst Kremer is a singer. Uh, I mean, it's an amateur performance, basically. Uh, Kremer was not a professional singer, but a conductor, uh, though he may well have sung well. So that's, that's, that's 1931. So it's probably, but Strauss was invited along anyway, uh, and it, it's noted in his diary. So that was in 1931. And that might have actually reminded him of these songs. So he, he actually writes the Bock and Bock again, Bock and Bock again, and says, are you sure you don't want to publish the Kramer Spiegel? So that was on November the 10th. Now, presumably, uh, uh, Bock and Bock uh, reply, I think uh, Hugo Bock's probably dead by then, but uh, whoever's running it wrote back and said no. So then he write, writes to his friend, uh, Furstner, saying, do you want to publish it? And Furstner turns it down. So he writes to Furstner on the 5th of December, uh, 1931, and uh, first the replies on the 10th saying, no. uh, obviously it's solidarity amongst the publishers. So there we have it. Uh, we've got the one, the, the, the limited luxury edition publication, um, which was published by Paul Cassirier, 
with engravings by Michael Fing Fingerston. You can still actually get hold of this. Uh, you can get it from, there are only 120 copies, but they sell for about 1,500 euros at the moment. Um, and each copy is signed by both Strauss uh, and uh, Fingerston. So that's it. That is when it was first published, and there are only 120 copies of it. So it was, wasn't available to people. So unless you actually knew about it, you know, people would have known about it, but they'd have been very select few uh, from a very small circle of people who were in the know. Uh, Clements Krauss was a great fan of the Kramerspiegel, and in fact it was him who suggested to Strauss that he used that music from Song 8 in, uh, in, in Capriccio, uh, which was his last opera, which he wrote in, 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 in that film too. When was it first published for the general public? 1959, by Boozy and Hawkes. So it's published in New York and London. And just to say, it's actually Kram Kramerspiegel, not Der Kramerspiegel. So when you look at the, the text, it's always published as Kramerspiegel, uh, with no uh, definite article. Um, so that's, that's it. So, that, that, so that, that was its publication, and we can just say a little bit more about the recordings. Now, the songs break up into two parts, as I say. The first part, the first... Uh, uh, the first seven songs are all about individual publishers and often individual people like Hugo Bock and Oscar von Haver and so on. Um, the, 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 the second five songs, songs 8 to 12, are about publication in general and publishers in general. Um, so, so that's it. So it, it breaks up into these two sorts of uh, two groups. Now, the, the songs are actually a little bit of a challenge to sing. Basically, to sing them, you've got to have a vocal range from top B flat to A, uh, and with an optional G flat, in fact, uh, in song 10. So it even goes down a, a little bit uh, down, down to G flat. Uh, and in fact, the, these top, top A's and B's, they, these are quite long sustained notes. You know, they need to be held for, for quite a while, so you, you need a good, a, good, a good top B flat or A. Um, and the, the bottom ones uh, are more passing, they, they, they're, they're already held, so they're, they're not so important. So obviously it suits a tenor or a soprano the best, that's the best thing. However, the most famous recordings were by Dietrich Fischer Diskau, and he recorded the cycle twice, in 1964 and 1969, and those have become the main reference point for later singers, for obvious reasons, and it's been mostly recorded by male voices as a result. Despite that the, that the earliest record performances were with soprano. I mean, the thing is, this was probably not known. Uh, I mean, bon, bon Tren, I mean, Von Trenner's um, chronic uh, only came out in the nineties, and um, I don't think Norman Delmar knew who the singers were. So everybody thinks that, uh, that the shopkeeper's mirror is for male voices, but it's not. It, it can be sung by sopranos perfectly well. The only, we only have one historic recording. So we've got Dietrich Fischer Diskar, who was German, obviously, um, and although he was he overlapped with Strauss's life, but he never knew Strauss, I don't think. He was busy fighting the Second World War, I think, in the army, from what I recall. Uh, he never worked with Strauss or performed with Strauss. But we do have one historic performance, and that's Julius Patzak. Now, Julius Patzak uh, was a tenor, and he, he worked with Strauss quite a bit. There are several recordings, uh, both orchestral, and, um, and at the piano, with the piano. So uh, Pat Sack was a, was a Viennese tenor, and um, in, during the Second World War, Strauss did two wartime broadcasts of his songs, and Julius Pat Sack sings on both of those. So you can, you can actually hear Pat Sack uh, singing accompanied by Strauss. Uh, so he, record, he, he did, also did orchestral recordings with Strauss as well. Uh, and also, he was he was the, one of the guys in, in Freedom Star. He was he sang at the, on the opera stage at the premiere of Freedom Strike. He also worked with, recorded Strauss songs with Clemens Krauss, who was a big fan of Prince Spiegel. And you know, after the war in the fifties, he did some wonderful performances as Herod in Salome. Uh, I think there are about three different recordings of that, and you can see one on YouTube of it. A brilliant, uh, a brilliant uh, Herod. Uh, so uh, th now. The songs that we have were, were released in 1955 uh, by um, by Prisa Records. Now Prisa is an Austrian record company, and it doesn't have a work, it doesn't have a global a global circulation. So the early DFD recordings, the first one was by Deutsche Grammophon, which obviously sells all over the world, and EMI. So basically, the Patsack songs really uh, haven't really been very well known. Uh, he's, 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 he's accompanied by Walter Klein. And, uh, 
you, you can now get it on, on Amazon, you can stream it now, but uh, these things really were probably more or less unknown except for specialists for quite a long time. So um, that's all I'd say. Uh, you know, the Dietrich Fisher Discount, those two recordings became the dominant ones, and after that there was very, very little actually. Um, in fact, as far as my research has got, there was, there was nothing really published until the 1990s. Uh, Knut Scram did something, um, and really, uh, Andrea Schmidt did something in the 1990s. Um, the first woman to record it is Elizabeth Watts, a soprano, uh, with Roger Vignoles. That's part of the Chandos Complete Strauss. That was in 2012. That's the Complete Song, Volume 6. That's the first time it's been sung by a soprano. Uh, and um, and that there are several recordings now, uh, but it's not by far, uh, it's not the most recorded song cycle. Uh, I might just say something, what, why, what is it about the song cycle? Uh, I, I've said it's because Dietrich Fischer Discow recorded uh, the first, uh, made the first uh, well-known recordings, and he's a male voice, so maybe that scared sopranos off. But I also think, of course, uh, the, 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 the subject matter, it's a little bit ribald in places, a bit rude in places. And that in, uh, in days when uh, ladies were supposed to be a bit more, uh, 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 you know, bit, uh, ladies were supposed to be a bit more ladylike. Uh, this maybe put some of them off, uh, have, having this rival content, whereas men men could do it. That, of course, doesn't apply nowadays. So uh, I'd encourage any sopranos who want to do it um, to, to to sing it. Uh, it. It's a great thing, and it's it was written, I think, for the soprano voice. Uh, although it's certainly okay with tenor. Most Strauss songs can, can you know uh, uh, can be done by the male or the female voice. Uh, this notion that, that Strauss wrote songs for, for sopranos, uh, it's true in his operas, but, but in his songs I don't think it's true at all. Uh, most of his songs he was quite happy to record with, with, with baritone, tenor, soprano, the whole lot, uh, with a few exceptions. Um, okay, so we'll, I'll just leave it at that there in, in, in this lecture, uh, in this talk, and I'll talk a little bit more about the actual content of the songs uh, in, a later, in a later talk. Okay, well I hope that's uh, given you a good introduction to these wonderful songs, and I do hope you listen to them and give them the attention to which they desire. So, um, see you later.